Hi, everyone. Yeah, we will be now talking a bit about the tools for uh, internationalization and translation in DHS2 web applications um, and the tools that we provide to do that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about translations and then um, we'll do an exercise on translations and following that we will talk a bit about data store um, and how to use that particularly with the app service data store um, tool. Uh, before I get into translations, however, I wanted to address the question that um, was brought up in, in the ch Zoom chat um, at the end of the last session. Um, which is how to uh, access um, uh, how to access the version of the DHS2 server that you're talking to from a web application. Um, I don't have any slides prepared for that, so I will just go ahead and um, do a live demo. We'll see how that goes. Um, in order to do that, um, I am going to I'm actually going to share a different window. A moment. Okay. You should see my window now, and it should have just gotten a bit smaller, so you can actually see it. Um, this is just going to be um, a way to create a new. Um, uh, I'm just going to create a new application um, uh, from from scratch, so we can go through that quickly as well. Um, I'm going to create a just a very simple. I'm going to make a new folder called um, uh, test app. I'm going to open that here. We're not going to get into. Uh, we we covered in the previous workshop. We covered how to set up your environment locally and all of that. Um, but in order to, to do this, I'm going to open my terminal. Um, I'm actually going Sorry, to awesome. go ahead. We are just seeing. Um, so I'm going to initialize my application. So I'm going to say D2 uh, app scripts, which I have installed globally already in it. And I'm going to say the, the uh, folder that I just created, which is called test app. And you'll see the files on the left here that are coming in that are being generated by this um, initialization script. Uh, I'm doing this just so we know that uh, this works out of the box in the platform um, and you can use it for uh, just about anything. Um, while this is loading, I'm actually gonna share my entire screen so that I can also show you a um, browser once we have this up. Okay. You should see my screen again. Uh, we're downloading this, um, uh, or in, installing the um, dependencies for this application. Um, once we have that done, uh, should take one moment. Sorry, this is taking a little bit longer. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show how this is done anyway. Um, so what we're going to use is we're going to use a um, uh, a function called use uh, use config. So this is uh, available from the app runtime. I'm going to save this file as test.js just so that I have syntax highlighting, and I can import a use config from a DHS2 slash app runtime. Now later in my component whatever the component that I'm building is, um, anywhere in my application, I can use this hook and I can get some info, some data back. So I'm not gonna fill that out yet. It says use config. There's no arguments to use config. And this will just give you information about the, um, uh, the application that you're running in and the server that you're talking to. So in the platform, you'll have um, one of the basic things that you might want to use if you're using another um, for instance, if you're using a uh, just a, a plain fetch to get some data from DHIS2 or something like that, you might want the base URL of the server that you're talking to. So you can get the base URL in this way using uh, the base URL return value. You can also get the API version, which 
will automatically be set to the, the highest API version available in the DJS2 instance that you're talking to. But if you wanted to retrieve that and get the get that data from uh, uh, dynamically, um, you could use that uh, here from use config. There's also um, server version, I believe is what this is called. And we're going to dump that out here so that we can uh, see what it looks like. So I'm actually just going to console log this server version. And then I can say, uh, I'm going to return something, whatever this is. Um, and return, actually, I'll just say base URL. API version, just so we have that um, rendered on the screen. But we're what we're really looking for is uh, console logging the server version. Um, so we're almost done here. This is taking quite slow, probably my internet. But we are now done. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to move this test.js into my source folder. I'm going to move my update my app.js so that I uh, just render um, instead of all of this. I'm just going to render the test component um, that I just uh, created. I have to import that. I'm going to go ahead and usually this should be, I'm going to call this test and say export default test. So this is maybe a little bit um, longer than, longer winded than we needed for this exa particular example. Um, but we're going to see see what this looks like, and this also kind of demonstrates how how you can quickly scaffold up a, an application and test out some some different theories. So let's go ahead and run. I have to go into my test app folder and run yarn start. Um, now I I also have this here, so you should still be able to see my screen. Don't let me know if you cannot. Uh, and I'm going to go to localhost 3000. Quite slow. So uh, I'm already logged in, and you can see that we have rendered the uh, base URL, the at symbol, and the version of the server that or the API that we're using. So this is whenever we construct an API URL, we use these two um, components. We say the base URL slash API slash version number, um, and that returns that. But now let's see what was actually logged to our console. So we'll see we got a an object here, um, which has the major version, the minor version, and the patch version uh, for the uh, particular server that we're talking to. So this is a 235.1 server. If we talked to a different instance, if, for instance, I logged out here and um, go back, and I'm going to log in now to a different server. Ah. So it's the same application talking to a different version of the server. We can see that we have a different base URL. Our API version is set to the highest version available for this server, which is 34. And the version that we got back is version 2.35 patch 5. And this is actually the snapshot version. So that means that it's not the, uh, an official release. This is a snapshot of a pre-release of 234.5, because 234.4 is the last latest release. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, let me know if you have any questions, further questions about um, the use config hook or getting access to server version information in your applications. Um, I'm not looking at the chat, so um, if Deborah, if anything comes up, if you could just mention it, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about translations. Oops, sorry, this is the beginning. Where did we go with the translation? So talking about translations, as um, Deborah mentioned, I18N stands for internationalization. There are 18 letters between I and N, which is why it um, is called that. 
Um, and underneath the hood, our internationalization um, system uses uh, something called I-18 Next. So if I open that up, just to give you a quick introduction, um, you can use basically all of the functionality of I-18 Next in uh, DHS2 applications using the D2 I-18N um, uh, library. And so there's a lot of functionality here, but this is basically just a, uh, a way to do um, uh, I, uh, internationalization in web applications. Um, so it does, uh, it does that at runtime. That's what it uses when, when your application is actually running. It uses I2 next to fetch the, the French version of a particular string in your, in your interface or something like that. Um, but what the platform also provides is a system for monitoring and generating translations. So the CLI app scripts by default, um, oops, no, we'll go back here. Um, this, this is how you would do it manually if you wanted to run these steps by yourself. But if you run yarn start or yarn build when you're, run, when you're in a platform application that uses G2 app scripts, all of this will be done automatically. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to run IT9 extract or IT9 generate. But underneath the hood, that, this is what the, the start and build scripts are doing. So when you run one of those um, uh, scripts, it will extract all of the strings from your uh, source code and put them into a file called en.pot. Um, that's basically the English um, version of the, um, uh, the strings in this application, which you can then translate to any other language. And it will allow your users to switch between English and French and Swahili and whatever other language you're, you're using in your application. So what this does is it uh, basically goes through every JavaScript file in the source folder, um, and it looks for a function calls that look like this one, i18n.t. Um, there's a few different kind of fancier ways to, to use that in different contexts, um, but it will always look for i18n.t, uh, and then it needs to be a literal string. This cannot be a variable. Um, this would be a literal string that is what you want to translate. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so that's what the extract does. It looks through all of your source code files for any places where it uses i18n.t, and then it uh, puts all of the, the strings that it finds into en.pot. Um, you can then run uh, i and generate. And again, this is automatically done in the start and build scripts for uh, the platform. But you can run generate, which takes that en.pot file and generates a uh, two, one, two or more files. One is in source locales. There will be an index.js file that must be imported by your application. So that basically will initialize the translations of all of the um, uh, components within your application from that generated source file. Uh, and it will also generate a number of uh, JSON files within source locales that are basically the English strings, the French strings, the Swahili strings, et cetera. Um, this is going to be improved in the near future. So uh, just be aware of that, that right now we're generating files into the application itself, but we're hoping to move this into the app shell soon so that you won't have to deal with it in the application at all. Um, there's a few challenges with, with making that happen. Um, for instance, loading translation strings from dependencies. Um, right now that works quite well, but you need to uh, basically do it at, at runtime and you need to have all of the strings um, loaded in those libraries. Um, but we're going to be working on lazy loading the additional language strings, um, which can be quite large um, in uh, libraries as well. Today in the latest version of the platform, um, when you load your application and your user is an English user, um, if you have 10 other languages specified in your application, those uh, language files will not be automatically loaded. That means that it will be a much smaller bundle size for your application. And when it first gets loaded, the JavaScript um, bundle file will be, can be significantly smaller. And then when a user um, that is, uh, has their configuration set to Russian, 
logs into your application, it will load the Russian version, uh, the Russian strings that are available um, and none of the other languages other than English. So it will continue to load the English strings and use those as a fallback. Um, but you will see that the bundle size is much reduced um, in, this, in this configuration. Um, so extract and generate steps happen under the hood for your yarn start and yarn build uh, scripts. Um, it's pretty straightforward to implement this in the platform. Um, this, this slide doesn't actually tell you that much more information, but basically you just need to add at DHIS2 slash D2 dash I18N um, in addition to your CLI app scripts. Probably the CLI app scripts would be a, a development dependency, but I just put this here for simplicity. Um, and then your start and build scripts are just exactly as they were when you initialized your application in the platform, which is D2 app script starts and D2 app scripts build. And therefore, automatically out of the box, your application will uh, translate any strings that it finds uh, into other languages. I'm going to go ahead and do a quick demo of this. Um, actually, first I'll show you the, the different versions of how to, how to do this. So as I mentioned, um, a simple translation is i18n.t with a literal string, meaning not a variable. Um, that i18n comes from at dhs2 slash d2 i18n. It can also be imported uh, equally from the source locales index.js that is generated. I'll show you how to do that. And you do need to load that once, at least in your um, app.js. If you are doing something a little bit more complicated, where sometimes a uh, just simply writing a string like hello world isn't going to be enough, um, because you might have a variable that the number changes based on um, some variable in your application, some data that you're loading from DHS2, for instance. Um, and depending on the language that you're translating that string into, uh, the, the, um, the, the way you translate it changes based on what that number means. So in English, for instance, we have um, we are one developer or we are X uh, like 10 developers. Um, and this actually, this, dem this example doesn't show how to change developer and developers. Um, you would then use, uh, actually you it does, um, the, this bottom example here is for plurals. So you have uh, count um, value and then you say um, it's one like if it's singular and multiple likes if it's plural. And other languages can also have different plural values if they have, um, some languages for instance have a different word for one thing three things or 10 things. There are different, um, different words for light in that language. So that also allows them to uh, specify that in, um, in different ways. Um, but at its most basic, we can just substitute a variable into the middle of our string somewhere. In this case, we're putting in the number of developers. This might also be uh, the name of a, an indicator or something like that. Um, and that can be put into the string using these double bracket notation. I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a quick demo of this. So I'm going to use that same, um, I'm going to get rid of this provider since we don't need that in the platform app. So now I'm back to basically a, a very simple um, uh, application. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, specify a, um, I'm going to load, first I'm going to import my I, D2 I18N, so my I18N function. So import I18N. And if we recall, I need to at least once import this from uh, locales slash index.js. You'll note that this doesn't exist yet. So in my source directory, there's no locales index. That can be a bit problematic. This is one of the reasons why we want to move this into the shell rather than in the application itself. Um, but if I uh, go ahead and say h1, uh, I'm going to tr translate this. So I'm going to say i18n.t, hello world. This could then be translated to any number of different languages. Um, and I'm going to get rid of this test because I don't need it. So uh, get rid of that. So now I have, I'm importing my i18n from locales index. I have this format where I have 
iotmn.t with a string literal that it will be uh, extracted into the iotmn folder at the top, uh, top of my um, application when I run yarn start. You'll notice that I was actually running yarn start um, when this happened. So my, my application was running, um, but it didn't automatically regenerate the translations. In order to do that, you need to run the, um, the script again. So you need to either run yarn start or yarn build again. So I'm gonna go ahead and run yarn start and keep an eye on the left side of my screen here where you'll see a new directory called IATNN and another new directory called source slash locales that will get generated. So you can see that those, those two got generated here. Um, I'm sorry, it just went to Brave. Um, you can also see in the um, output of this yarn start script, we say generating internationalization strings and then writing one language strings to IATNN en.plot. Um, and then it also uh, writes those into this locales directory. So let's look at that en.pot file. Um, there's some information up here at the top. This is pretty specific to um, what, uh, what you're looking for in, um, uh, yeah, what, what language this is describing and some other things about how to do plurals in for this language. You can look up this um, uh, basically you know, ITN, ITN, uh, or IT Next documentation will have information about how to do this for different languages. Um, but we will see here that we have our message ID, hello world, uh, and then an empty string. Because this is English, we don't need to specify what it is, but we could easily say hello world exclamation point. Um, now we can translate that. So I'm going to copy this en.pot file and paste it. So I have a copy now, but I'm going to name this one um, ES. So this is going to be Spanish. And for the PO stands for, um, uh, I forget exactly what that stands for, but um, POT, uh, the T in, in that stands for template. So for other languages that are going to be replacing the English strings in our app, we're going to use uh, the .PO extension. Um, and so here, we're, we're gonna keep this the same for now. Again, you could look up how to do this. You can use a service like, um, there's one called TransFX that we use for our core applications to do these, uh, trend, to generate these files and allow uh, people to uh, contribute their, um, their translations, which you can set up for your own applications as well if you'd like. Um, but for now, we're going to do it manually. So our, our message ID is still the English string, hello world. Um, but we need to now translate this into Spanish. So our, our new translation is going to be hola. Um, uh, mundo. Exclamation point. Um, so now we have uh, en.pot, es.po. Um, we still only have one translations.json, which is generated when we ran this script. So I'm going to run that again. And you'll see that we also now have an ES. Um, and apparently I changed it in the wrong one. So I I made the, the ES.PO hello world and my en.pot hola el mundo. Um, that's gonna be incorrect. So I'm gonna change that back. I'm gonna regenerate this. Now, when we look at our localhost 3000, we see hello world. But if I change my locale, I'm going to change the locale for this particular user. So I go to settings, can I change the interface language to Spanish? And then I go back to this application and I see hola el mundo. So this is um, how we do translations in our application. In the source code, if we look at the source code again, um, the source code only has the English string. Um, so it just says hello world, but uh, our application knows how to translate hello world into hola el mundo um, in, uh, um, uh, yeah, in in the at runtime once this uh, once it figures out what language the user wants to use. Few uh, gotchas here. This needs to happen. This iatnn.t hello world 
needs to happen at runtime. And that's because we need to translate this after the user has is logged in and the application is loaded, because before that, we don't know what language the user has selected. Um, when the application first loads, we haven't loaded the, the preferences for the user. And so we have to assume that it's English. Um, in some cases, it can be problematic if you do something like this. Um, um, hello, text equals this. Hello, text. Um, this is problematic because um, the hello text is translated on uh, initial startup, which is actually in um, sometimes in English rather than in whatever the locale of the user is. Um, so I would uh, recommend avoiding this. If you are using the platform, this actually is probably okay because the the application code gets loaded after the initialization of the application. So it, we actually code split the bundle for an, a platform app between the shell and the application. The shell loads the server version. It loads the um, information about the user and what locale they're, they, they've selected. And then it loads the code for your uh, application itself. Uh, so it can it can actually work in um, platform applications, but just be aware of this that um, it can be problematic in some cases. So I would recommend generally avoiding it and just keeping the um, IT9.t uh, function calls in your render functions for your components. The other thing that you want to avoid here is using a variable, as I mentioned. So hello text equals this. If I say hello text here. When, when I try to generate the, um, the strings from all of the source files in my application, which happens automatically on yarn start and yarn build, uh, this, it doesn't know what this is. So this variable is specified at runtime. So the, um, when, when we're just building this, we don't know what hello text is. This might be coming from other variables. It might be um, specified somewhere else entirely. So you need to always have the literal string. So the thing that's in quotes needs to be the argument to this i18n.t. Otherwise, it won't be able to generate a translation key. It's another thing to keep in mind. Um, um, and we're going to now add a, an interpolation here. So we're going to have an adjective. I'm just going to call it adjective. Hello, adjective world, um, and then we're going to change what that word what that word is um, based on um, um, let's see um, yeah let's let's do that that's adjective so um, if we look back at our system, we'll see that in order to do interpolations. We have number of devs as the variable name in the string, and also number of devs as the um, the key in the object as the second argument to i18n.t. So I'm going to go back to, over to the code. I'm going to do that. So I said adjective was the name here. Um, I'm going to call it adjective. And I'm going to say the adjective is going to be um, beautiful. So now I'm going to go ahead and regenerate this. So now we can see that it says, hello, beautiful world, even though the string that we're passing to the translation is hello, adjective world. Um, obviously, this is a little bit problematic because beautiful is in English. And so we would probably want hello, beautiful world uh, to be um, specified in the translation string. Um, but this is just an example of how to, how to do this. And it's, it, it's even more useful. So let's say, um, uh, if we go, if we use our name instead. So I'm going to use a uh, um, data query here equals uh, query equals source me and 
fields or params, sorry. Uh, and I need a, a name for the response. So me is going to be result me params fields display name. And I'm just going to do something like this. I'm actually going to change this. I'm coding quickly here just to show you kind of how to build up an application. Um, some of this is obviously review, um, but uh, we have loading error data coming from use data query with this query. Um, and then we're going to end up returning this. Um, and so I'm going to say hello name instead. So this is a good example of a use of um, the uh, variables or, or in, in uh, translations or internationalization. And I'm going to use the for the name variable here. I'm going to pass data. Dot, and actually, this is a kind of a fancy trick, but you can actually do question mark dot. Um, question mark dot uh, me dot display name. Um, so this is actually going to be a little bit funky because when data is undefined, this will be undefined. So we're going to say hello undefined until while we're loading, and then eventually we'll replace it with the display name of the user. Um, and I think this is actually name, not display name. Apologies. Um, we could also, as we've seen in the past, say if loading return loading. Um, uh, or we could do that within this as well, but I'm um, not going to do that today. Um, so I'm just going to do this here and see what happens. We can get rid of the loading in the error. And let's see what's going on here. And look. We've got hello, the name. So the hello and the exclamation point both come from the translation. The name comes from the, a variable that we're passing in um, that we don't know at compile time. There's no way we could know the name of the user when we're actually loading this. Um, but now we do need to change the translation. So if we go ahead and generate this again, we'll see that this becomes hello name exclamation point. Um, but we actually need to change ES as well because hello world is no longer a string that we want to translate. So we can just copy this over here and we can say hola name exclamation point. And actually with this, uh, I forget how to do it, but I'm going to do this here as well, because in, in Spanish, when you have a um, uh, an exclamation sentence, you uh, start it with an upside down exclamation point as well. Um, so you would put an upside exclamation point in this um, uh, translation. Now, if we restart this to regenerate the translations, oops. We get this hola Jean. Um, so this uh, is translated to Spanish. Again, if I switch my user back to um, English, you'll notice also actually before I do that, you'll notice also that um, all of the the header bar, the application names, the search for the applications, the um, uh, uh, yeah the the dialogue here. Is all in, in Spanish now as well because I'm located in or I'm configured to be in Spanish, and that's something that you would need to do yourself if you weren't using the platform. So that's done for you as well. I'm going to go ahead and configure this and switch to English again. Now we'll see that hello John Squirrel is what uh, gets loaded. There we go. So that was a, a quick demo of uh, internationalization, some things that we can do. I'm not going to go through plurals um, in the demonstration here today, but you can also do a number of more advanced things that you can find on the IT Next website um, that will allow you to do things like plural uh, handling. Let's go ahead and go through this a little bit. There's a couple things to remember. Um, 
these are basically what I've already said, but um, I'm going to go through it again. Um, one that I didn't cover is that you want to make sure that you only have one DHS2 slash D2 I18N in your project. This means that if you have a library that you're depending on, which also requires D2 I18N, you want to make sure that you're not, you don't have two different versions in your bundle, because then you'll have two different copies of the translations and one of them will have the ones that you need and one of them won't uh, and you'll end up with missing translations in your interface um, so you can use um, like source map explorer uh, or just looking at um, uh, the uh, yarn um, output to figure out if you have duplicate multiples of these that's probably something that um, we should write up a, a guide for how to how to investigate the duplicate dependencies in your bundles um, which you should generally avoid um, as I mentioned, itnn.t should happen at render time. Um, so you should use the, that itnn.t in the component render function itself. Um, you need to generate the files uh, that are at source locales, but they should not be committed to your repository as a general rule. Um, so source locales index and source locales uh, language translations.json typically are excluded in the git ignore. Um, you should ensure that you only have one version of dependencies which have translations. So similar to, similarly to having um, DHS2, D2, I2N only appear once in your bundle. If you have a dependency like uh, UI widgets or um, uh, another library that has translations in it, if you have two copies of that library, you might end up with over like them overriding each other in the translation map. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you don't duplicate that. Um, and then finally, um, you need to import the source locales index.js somewhere in the application before all the other translations load. Um, usually this is in source app.js, but um, in some cases you can just, you can always, I, I usually try to recommend that you always import from locales index.js, no matter where you are in your application so that you never are going to um, have run into a situation where you haven't yet imported this when you're trying to do a translation. Um, again, that's something that's going to be improved in the near future in the platform so that it does all of this in the shell rather than relying on doing it in the application. OK, uh, that's all I had for um, translations. I'm, does anyone have any questions? 